This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Abraham, Chris Cast, Season 5, Episode 61. My name's Chris Abraham, and I am riffing today about the idea of the, I don't know, the paradox, the contradiction, the hypocrisy about legal gun ownership or even any gun ownership in America. And I find it extremely confounding. For example... My biggest example is there was a guy called Lakota Man. And Lakota is a an Indian tribe, and he's very anti-gun. And I just kept on tweeting him that the Lakota, the indigenous people of America, the indigenous people of any country, were subjugated by armies and weapons. They were subjugated as, at first, what the invaders call the primitive people. And while other people are like, well, the Native Americans had muskets too. They were, they were, they stole muskets and bought muskets from their, from their enemies well, well after most of the slaughter was happening, after most of the slaughter happened. And the American Indians have been subjugated to reservations. They've been uh, subjugated to schools. They've been subjugated by lawmen. They've been subjugated again and again by law enforcement agencies and people with guns. They've been subjugated by their oppressor's government. They've been subjugated by their uh, subjugators' armies and officers and prison guards and lawmen and soldiers. They've been subjugated by uh, the military industrial complex. They've been subjugated by people in social services who have the backing of um, who have the backing of the uh, of the law. And uh, as a direct result, I, if I were a Native American indigenous person or Pacific Islander, such as someone living in Lahaina or someone living on Maui or someone living on Oahu, or someone living on the Big Island, or someone who uses their words to say that they want um, sovereignty from America, if they think that voting is ever going to allow them to cast off the chains of their oppressor or of their subjugator, uh, they're, they've got to be kidding. So why would anybody cast off their rights to protect themselves using lethal force to protect themselves, to protect their families. Um, if your own people are shooting you, that's your fault. If your own communities are shooting you, that's kind of on you. That's something that you need to address. That's something that one needs to address. If your own people are stealing from you, if your own people are shooting you dead in the block, if your own people are accidentally killing children in buildings during drive-bys that has nothing to do with the government but the initial the initial system think about it enslaved peoples what do they have taken away from them enslaved peoples not free people enslaved peoples do not have access to weapons guns knives pikes whatevers they do not have access people in prison even have access to ships but if you are imprisoned, if you are enslaved, you cannot own what you want. If you are imprisoned, if you are enslaved, you cannot defend yourself with any parity or any equality or any equity to those around you. Now, in your idea of a Star Trek Federation of Space, where we live in a gentle world, where the government can be um, trusted to not ever raise a hand against you, where you are given carte blanche to be safe. And by being safe, it doesn't mean free. It means that you are protected, not free, you're protected, and that nobody ever will harm you with lethal force or with traumatic force. If that's what you're looking for in life, for yourself and others, 
then that's fine. But you had better trust the powers that be, the powers that are there to take care of your fish tank, the people who make sure that the pH balance in your tank water is perfect to make sure that a piranha is really a piranha before it's removed from the tank, to make sure that the spontaneous desire of the tank owner only to have yellowfish and not bluefish, to care about the, the equity of the fish and not just want the fish du jour that the, that the tank owner wants. You need to have such a benevolent controller. You need to cede your control to such a benevolent god. You need to trust the leader of your cult so completely that uh, you really never need ever worry about it ever again, right? And, you know, one might see this as paternalism, and maybe paternalism is good. Maybe it's good to have a daddy and a mommy who love you. But sadly, the people who always feel this way seem to have had daddies and mommies, brothers and sisters, grandma and grandpas, who they could trust and love, and who would go to the moon and back in order to make sure that they are and ever shall be safe, right? Like, if you come from a broken home, or if you are an orphan, or if you find yourself in the system, or if you are the survivor of childhood sexual assault, or if you've been raped by your family members, or if you've been beaten for disobeying or defiance, if you have been beat up because you do not comply, if you have physically ever been forced or prevented or restricted or bound or, you know, I'm talking well beyond having a, you know, I'm talking well beyond a spanking or even a paddling or even, you know, being not allowed to go anywhere or gas having your phone taken away from you. If you believe that the people who you put in power, who work for the sheriff's department, who work for uh, the local security form, who make up the, uh, the legal structures, who are um, public, uh, not public defenders, but public prosecutors, if you trust public prosecutors, if you trust uh, judges, if you trust sheriffs and deputies, and uh, uh, literally beat cops if you trust them to only keep you safe with your weapons, with their weapons, your weapons, their public weapons, their weapons paid for by tax dollars. If also, once you get that safety, you need to put down all of your defiance, right? So once you've ceded control over to a, uh, it to a, caretaker to a society caretaker that aspires for the greater good and wants to put the safety of the many and suppress, oppress, remove, destroy, kill, imprison the voice of the few that contaminates, hurts, destroys, or dissettles, or threatens, or literally, figuratively, through words or deeds, makes the greatest corpus feel safe. You need to stop being an activist, right? You need to stop finding the next thing to uh, protest, right? You need to take the W, as the kids say, take the dub, and then you need to um, be willing at that point to uh, put down all of your weapons because if you become the father, if your natural tendency towards rabble rousing if you end up let's say banning all guns and then take to the streets because you are a community organizer and everything you've done has been to train you to be a better activist and to make change in the world what happens when your change agent when your catalyst when your uh fight the chains of uh, of oppression what about when your defiance becomes painful or hurtful or unpleasant through words or deeds to make the largest, larger corpus who you have then made gunless, weaponless, defensiveless. You have made them defensiveless. And then at that moment, 
any single thing can thereby be labeled as through words or ideas or deeds, those activist decisions that you make, the same activists who had the Second Amendment uh, um, rolled back or, or defeated, the same activism that got the Second Amendment defeated and got um, all guns banned in all 50 states, except for people with licenses to do licensed hunting, licensed sport, and uh, maybe licensed pen- pest control, um, those people now will have to put down not only their guns, but if, uh, if for the, the good of the many, the few must die, um, any kind of, at that point, the weapon is in the air and there will be nothing, not even the threat of something, uh, to stop anybody from doing anything to you. In fact, if we even just consider the Second Amendment to be a signifier, a, an avatar uh, of this idea of personal freedom, right? There's nothing more personally free. There's no more signifier of personal freedom than your personal responsibility of owning, maintaining a firearm that can take a life of yourself or others. Uh, that kind of autonomy is a, an important icon that represents other things, right? They're all litmus tests. They're all, what is it called? They're all canaries in the coal mine. They're all warning signs. If you find that it is really difficult to uh, support the First Amendment, that you find that your free speech is being shadow banned or bozo filtered, not at a person by person level, but at a corporate level, at a governmental level, at a national level, at a transnational level, if you find that all of a sudden, and I do these testings all the time, I'm always trying to test to see whether or not I can share Sputnik or RT articles, and you're just not allowed if you share an RT.com article on Facebook. In America, it tells you that even the sharing of that URL breaks community standards so you're not even allowed to do it not even with a uh, a um, warning not even with anything it's still okay right now i've been sharing those things on twitter but i know for a fact that for at least 10 years i've been extremely shadow banned on twitter i have 42.5 thousand followers and my level of engagement is almost nothing um I have to be retweeted by one person, uh, and then all of a sudden my stuff blows up. Like, I've been extremely bozo-filtered, not at a personal level. When I do a review as to whether or not my stuff is considered spam followers, it's usually just 1%. This is an active thing that is only coming out of the news now, which is to say um, I've been shadow banned for a decade. Like, I've never been kicked off. But I have been kicked off of uh, YouTube. My YouTube.com slash Chris Abraham was completely summarily executed uh, about a year ago. And I didn't make a big deal about it because, honestly, I'm not that attached to things like that. But a lot of you have realized that uh, I'm not an activist. I'm just a pattern recognizer. And maybe that's because I have aphantasia. Maybe it's less easy for hearts and minds stuff to work on me. I mean, I have no attachment to Russia. I just don't have an attachment to Ukraine either. Neither of them are my adversaries. I have no generational or thousand year hatred against Russia or Ukraine. I have no personal hate, hatred against the Soviet Union. I have no personal animus to Putin. In fact, I'm surprised he's been able to keep the band together for so long. Um, we've wanted regime, regime change for 20 years. Um, and, you know, Russia still, you know, it's not communist anymore. It's actually quite aggressively trad cath, right? It's like um, Eastern Orthodox out the wazoo, very much obsessed with breeding pairs of people making babies. Um, people in the, the uh, Eastern Europe are obsessed with making sure women do not hurt their their uh, their wombs. Go to Russia, sit down in a as a woman. Go to Russia, sit down on the ground without a piece of paper or 
uh, don't wear stockings or whatever. And, you know, Slovenia is like this. Not supposed to be on the uh, sidewalk, brother. I'll push you off next time. Um, so anyway, uh, that was nice of me. But it's true, man. You shouldn't be riding, doing your ride. Like, it, this this road is, com Walter Reed is completely empty of cars. Like, there's no reason why someone should be riding their e-bike on uh, on the sidewalk. Guy almost walked, it, almost uh, rode into me. Um, I have no problem, Chris versus bicyclist at all. So we'll see if that happens. Maybe you'll see my mugshot soon. Anyway, I'm here at the cafe. I don't know if that made any sense, but uh, there's that quote right about uh, um, trading safety for freedom kind of stuff. And I think the same people who want freedom have proven they don't want safety. And I'm sh learned that the people who say they want safety have no real desire for freedom. Amen, amen, amen. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.